the infancy of all this. We have the ages to come. God is going to show the exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. And unto Him be glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. These are the songs we've written just seeing darkly through a glass. The hymn book ain't done. The hymn book ain't done. We're going to sing about him forevermore. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Good message this morning by Eric. It's, uh, you go out. I'll just say it like this. The homosexual and sodomite and all these people ain't, ain't ashamed of their image. Why should we be ashamed of the image of God's son? Amen. It's sad and pathetic that a lot of Christians are scared to death to bear that image of Christ out in this world. It's an image that the world don't like. Amen? Well, we have to bear it. You know, Paul, or, or as I said up there in Morgantown, we had a bunch of people coming up, oh, I worship Satan. No, thank you. I'm a practicing Satanist and all this. I guarantee you those same people sit and whine and complain about the condition of the world all the time. All oppression, all this, all that, war, blah, blah, blah. He's the God of it. Yeah. The one you're worshiping, the one you're hailing, he's the God of it. Yes, sir. Yep. Amen. Corin told him yesterday, he said, you're worshiping a loser. <laughs> Spoiled principality and power. A being that thought he was so smart and God took him in his own craftiness. Amen? God took him in his weakness. Amen? First Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to wrap this up this morning. We're going to wrap up this stuff on the ministry. And now you come to the last church Paul addresses. I say without apology that I believe Paul's Romans through 2 Thessalonians makes up a curriculum of the church. I believe they are a course of study designed to take us from our foundation all the way up to this perfection that we are trying to achieve here in Thessalonians. Paul says of this church that they are examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. These saints were examples to all that believe around them. Amen? And Paul says here in verse 2 that we give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. Now notice this now. Notice verse 3, remembering, and then notice down here in verse 4, knowing. Paul remembered something without ceasing because he knew something. But also these Thessalonians have a work, a labor, and a patience knowing something. Right? You see it? Remembering without ceasing. What did Paul remember without ceasing? Your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father knowing what? Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. You know what that means? Those three things that Paul remembered without ceasing pertain to your election of God. Amen? You know how many people have been, been in church their whole life and don't know why they're saved? If you don't know why you're saved, you don't know what you're supposed to be doing today. Amen? Your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, your election of God. These three things pertain to our election. Amen? It's what we are to remember without ceasing like Paul did. Because it pertains to our election. Notice we're doing it in the sight of God. Amen? Now this just... Once again, what epistle becomes, comes before 1 Thessalonians? Colossians, right? So naturally, just like all of Paul's other epistles, is this thing not going to work this morning? 
So just like Paul, all of Paul's other epistles, they're linked together. Amen? At the end of 2 Corinthians, remember, he started warning them about those who preach another gospel. Galatians, begin, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He ends Galatians talking about the new creature. And in Ephesians, he begins to educate you on the new creature. At the end of Ephesians, he tells you to take on the whole armor of God. And in Philippians, he shows you how to use it. Amen? Now we come here to Colossians. Look at how he ended, started closing the book of Colossians. Put on, therefore, as the what? Elect of God. What does that mean? Do you know what you're elect to? The church that God is building today is something he chose to do before the foundation of the world in accordance to his eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. We are called with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to God's own purpose and grace that was given to us in Christ before the world began. As the, get that, as, put on, as the elect of God. Remember what he told him in chapter three? If ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above and not on the things of the earth. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ and God. What are we supposed to be seeking? Things above, what are they? Paul said, while well, we look not at the things that are seen. I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man, but God hath revealed them what? By what? God has revealed something to us by his spirit that Paul now tells you to seek. Do you remember what your election was about? Where are you seated right now? In heavenly places in Christ. What were you elect for? You were elect to receive of these unsearchable riches of Christ in the heavenly places. Thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers. You were called to reign with Christ. To reconcile the heavenly Government back to God. Why? Because God says the heavens are not clean in his sight. He putteth no trust in his saints. Yea, the heavens are not clean in his sight. You have these beings up there that know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. You have beings up here in high places that walk in darkness. Their judgment is corrupt. They rule unjustly. The heavens are not clean. And God raised his son up here, set him at his own right hand, far above all principality and power, put all things under his feet, and then gave him to be the head of this church that he is creating in the heavenly places. Amen. For what purpose? To reconcile the heavens back to God. And so you as the elect of God are to put some things on as that elect. God doesn't want you going up there with the same mind that you had when you was lost. He doesn't want you to continue walking by the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. Self-willed, pride, full of envy and hatred and contention, striving and... Preach. You're elect for something. Yeah. And as that elect, you are to put on some things. Yeah. What are we to put on? Bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any... Even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Those are the things that we are to put on as the elect of God. 
Those are the things that, that God wants us to have furnished in us and how he wants us to reign with the Lord Jesus Christ one day. Amen? Put on therefore as the elect of God. And so Paul, knowing the election of these Thessalonians, and these Thessalonians, knowing their election of God, remembered without ceasing the work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. Notice who it's in the sight of. It's in the sight of the God and Father who elected you. He's watching. Not only is he watching, the angels are watching. God is putting on display his work of faith in his church. The mystery of godliness is God manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Amen. Amen? That's what Paul is talking about here. We do these things in the sight of God, knowing our election of God. Remember when Paul said, seeing then we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not. But by manifestation, but, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Amen. That's what we were doing yesterday. I've still got flesh. I still got sin. I still got issues. But I also got a big dose and measure of God's Son in me. Come on, preacher. And we went out yesterday to put Him on display. To bear in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. That's what God wants with that body right now. You got a new body for when you go up here, but he wants that body you got right now to manifest something in it. That's what we've been talking about. Amen? And so this work here, this work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in the sight of God is because we know our election of God. Meaning by the time you get to Thessalonians, we are in full understanding of our, ca our calling and election and our operating in faith, hope, and charity. We have left the know ye nots right. all the way back to 2 Corinthians. We've left the God forbids in Galatians 6.14. We've left the foolish Galatians. We have left the straightened Corinthians. Amen? We are now striving together, pressing toward the mark for the prize. You understand, Thessalonians, what it's about. It's about people. It's about people remembering without ceasing their work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope, knowing their election of God. Amen. Amen. Right. You're, dealing, you're, dealing with, you're dealing with people here that are in understanding of some things. They don't need to be told, no, you're not. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. What shall we continue in sin that grace may about God forbid? We've left that stuff behind. We are now in that work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope, knowing our election of God. And that first one we're looking at right here, the work of faith. I know how God is getting men ready for that election. Yes, sir. And it's not religion. It's a book. It's a book. Right here. Right here is how God deals with man and gets them ready for their calling and election. Amen? It's a book. It's a book. The work of faith. What is the work of faith? It's the inward work of God's word in us. Right? Look back here at Galatians chapter 3. For ye are all the children of God by what? You know the issue with the Galatians is not justification. 
Did y'all know that? What, you think the Gentiles, all right, let's look at the Galatians. All right, they believe the gospel, right? And then a little bit later, they went under the law. Do you think they lost their salvation? The issue with the Galatian church is not justification. That is not what Paul's dealing with in Galatians. You know what he's dealing with in Galatians? He's dealing with these justified men becoming sons. Now that'll get me in trouble. But that's what it's about. It's about you. He said, you did run well. Who did what? So they've been hindered. Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? You see, these Galatians started out, they're justified. Galatians, Paul ain't dealing with how a man's justified. He's dealing with these heirs of God, these children becoming adults and sons. Because God wants more from you than just believe the gospel and go to heaven. You have an election, a purpose. And he's given us this faith to do that work in us to, to suit us and make us worthy of that calling and election. Right? It's the work of faith. Look right here. For you're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now look at what he says. Now I say that the heir, that's what you are. The heir as long as he is a what? Differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. So the subject here is the heir. Now watch this. The subject is the heir. Are you a child of God? And if children, then what? Heirs, heirs of God, right? So as a child of God, how did you become a child of God? By faith in Christ Jesus. And as a child of God, you become an heir of God. Now, what do you do with the heir as long as he is a child? Well, are you? See, all these brethren running around, oh, I don't believe the, the adoption is the redemption of the body. Okay, if the adoption hasn't taken place, then you're under the law, big boy. You can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't scream, I'm not under the law, but then say, I'm not a son either. Yeah, that's a good point. Because what you do with an heir, if he's a child, you put him under tutors and governors. That was the law. All right? When the time, the time appointed of the father, that deals with adoption. That's when God removed, or that's when a man removes the status of a child, frees him from the tutors and governors, and sets him at liberty as an adult heir in his home. Amen. Amen. So what are you? Are you a child or are you a son? Let's see what Paul says about it. It's good. Even so we, when we were, were Children, and because ye are sons. Well, how did that take place? How did, how did they go from children to sons? Well, that child doesn't go from a child to a son until the time appointed of the father. So let's look at what he says. When we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of what? And because ye are, God has sent forth the spirit of what? Where? Crying what? You see that? Now, listen to me. When we were children, when a man's a child, he's under the law. 
When he becomes a son, he set at liberty. Now, but the father will only set that son at liberty when he thinks that son is worthy to have that liberty. That's a wise son. Do you want to know why God raised his son from the dead and set him at his own right hand and put all things under his feet? Because he's well pleased with him. Do you know what God sent you? He sent you the spirit of what? His son. Now these people run around and they say, oh, 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 the adoption is the redemption of the body and blah, 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 blah. Or you're either under the law or you're not. They go around and they say, well, we're not under the law. What is, why are you not under the law? If you're a child, why are you not under the law? If you're not a son, why are you not under the law? Explain that to me. You can't say I'm not under the law. A lot of the times, it's just that they want to be lawless. Why are you not under the law? Because you're led of what? If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. See, some of you are sitting here confused right now. I don't even know what he's talking about. It's Galatians. There's a lot more after Galatians. You better start getting it. You an heir? The Galatians didn't get it either. And because of that, instead of becoming functional sons, they're acting like a bunch of children in elementary school. Amen. If ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Why? For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The reason you're not under the reason you're not under the law is because you're not a child, you're a son being led of that spirit. Amen. What spirit is leading you? The spirit of his son. You see, that's the reality of what God did. Because you are a son, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Right here, guys. Tutors and governors. Son. The spirit God is giving us right now through these epistles is the spirit of his son. Instead of putting us, when, we, when God made us his children by faith in Christ and made us his heirs, instead of treating us as children under the law, he sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts. Amen. So you don't need to go back to the law. You move forward. That's the work of faith right there we're talking about. I hope you understand this. I hope you understand it. I hope you get it. This is the work of faith. The word of God. The word of God comes. It's believed. Through that faith, you're receiving the spirit. And through that spirit, you're operating as sons. Amen? My little what? Don't you wish Paul would make his mind up? Your sons, my little children. Don't you wish he'd make his mind up? They are sons positionally. Their status in the house of God is not that of a child. It's of a son. And because they're sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into their hearts. But what are they doing? They're going back to the law. So even though they're sons positionally in the house, they're not functioning as sons because they're not continuing in the spirit. So Paul calls them little children. Of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed where? That's the work of faith. It is the spirit of God's son. 
That's what God is doing, guys. You want to read your New Testament? The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of who? The Son of God. Amen. Faith of Christ. People running around, I just believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. Did I believe hard enough? Did I believe the right thing? Believe, believe, believe. Oh, there you go. I don't know about you, I'm living by the faith of God's Son. The, the Word of God is not giving you your faith. The Word of God is giving you the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Spirit of Christ. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Whose spirit are you getting through the book? Don't worry about Paul Lucas. He's nailed to the cross. Amen. One of these days I'll get a new body and we'll be rid of him forever. Quit worrying about where I still fall short. I'll quit worrying about where you still fall short. This is about getting Christ into people. Yes. Yeah. Amen? The mind of who? Christ. Whose epistle are you? Christ. The love of who? Christ. Obedience of who? Christ. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. The power of Christ. This is your new, this is Paul's epistles right here. Right? Law of Christ. Eric read it, read it this morning. So fulfill ye the law of Christ. Paul says, when he went to them that were without law, he went as without law, being not without law to God, but under law to Christ. Law of Christ, mystery of Christ, fullness of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as the sufferings of Christ abound in us. I've suffered the loss of all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of... Do you know what free gift God is giving you through the ministry of faith? Do you know what he's given you through that faith? He's given you Christ. That's the prize. Let no man beguile you of your what? Amen. You say, I don't get it, preacher. Most religious people don't. They're still trying to do something. What God has given you through this book is Jesus Christ. You can have as much of him as you want. There you go. If he didn't spare him, if that man died for you, do you think God will not freely give you his life? But people just want to just keep doing stuff, keep trying their best. It can't be as simple as just reading the book. It is. It's that easy. Believe the book. God will do the work in you. This is what he'll give you. He'll give you the faith of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, make you the epistle of Christ, give you the love of Christ, the obedience of Christ, the power of Christ. He'll do all of that through this work of faith. This is why we emphasize the book. What is the work of faith? It's God forming Christ in you. And the measure of faith, the measure of faith that we have is the measure of Christ in us. And we function in the body of Christ according to this measure of Christ. The old man don't get to participate in the body. That's why you're told to put him off. He's corrupt. He's not salvageable. You can't salvage a part of the old man. Paul said, 
put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There's the new man. The old man don't get to participate. So how do you participate in the body of Christ? You only participate in the body of Christ according to the measure of Christ in you. That's the work of faith. People's always worried about what others aren't doing or what they are doing and that person does, still does this and that person still does that. Y'all got your problems. God ain't doing anything through me. He's doing everything through Jesus Christ. Amen. Who then is Paul? Who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. So then he said, I planted, Apollos watered, God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth, nor he that watereth anything, but God that giveth the increase. Amen. What does he say over there? That not no one of you be puffed up for one against another. I've heard, I've heard Ruckmanite, you know, Campbellite, Calvinist, Lutheran, puffed up for one against another. McLean and Jordan. Terrence and Richard, whose side are you on? Not one of them. I'm on the King James Bible side. And I love those men. I think those men are part of the ministry. But I'm not puffed up for one against another. Everything God is doing, if any man glory, let him glory in the Lord. It's Jesus Christ in us that's doing the work. Amen? Now you have to understand why Paul tells these Galatians, man, to not go back to this law, but continue in the Spirit so that they can, so that God can form His Son in them so that they can walk in that Spirit and participate in the body of Christ. It's not a coincidence that after Galatians you come to Ephesians where you start learning about your inheritance, your position, your exaltation, and how to walk worthy of that calling. It's not a coincidence. I know this, I know that this stuff goes whoop, right over the head of Christians that's been in possession of a King James Bible their whole life. America's had a King James Bible for f over 400 years. And right, it's right here. It's all right here. Remember where we started. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Inheritance, heirs, why did God give us the spirit of his son? Ephesians. Now we're going to come into the book of Ephesians where Paul tells us here, understanding this bigger picture as a son, as an heir, as a, as a member of Christ, as a member of Functioning in Christ by that Spirit, I want you to understand the bigger picture of it. Look right here. Hath put all things where? So what's under what's under his feet? What's under his feet? All things. Then what does that mean is not under him? Nothing. God hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over what? A guy's there a difference between his feet and his head? 
What's under his feet? What's he head over? Which is his what? Which is his what? His fullness. Do you know what the church is? The church is the fullness of Christ. There's his feet. All things are under it. There's the head. And the body of Christ is the fullness of Christ that filleth all in all. Now you understand the bigger picture. That every one of us in this calling and election is to make up the fullness of this new man in the heavenly places. Amen. Knowing your election of God. Every one of us have this calling and election. We were all called in one hope of our calling. Look at this verse. Even when we were dead in sins. Amen, Bill? Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together where? In Christ that in the what? He might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Here's what God did. Paul, dead. Dead in sins. He took this man, he took me, quickened me, and then raised me up and made me sit together up here in these heavenly places in the Lord Jesus Christ so that in the ages to come he might show something. That he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. I ain't even seen it all yet. What I know is that Jesus Christ is the heir of unsearchable riches in the heavenly places and this church is being created to receive of those riches. Wow. Now Paul says this. There is how many bodies? Have y'all ever seen a man hate his own body? Have y'all ever, what did Paul say over there? He says, he says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. He that loveth his wife loveth his flesh. For I've never yet seen a man hate his own flesh, but nourisheth it and cherisheth it even as Christ the church. You got that spirit in you? You know the evidence of that spirit being in you? It loves the body. It doesn't fight and devour it. Contend and strive and puff up and destroy and A man that's operating in the spirit, there's one body and one spirit. A man functioning in that spirit loves the body. Paul says this, and what Paul's talking about here is the unity of the spirit. I'm learning it more and more, man. I've got a long ways to go, guys. I'm not sitting up here saying, I've got it licked. I battle bitterness, I battle anger, malice, I battle these things on a daily basis. I battle the lust of my flesh on a daily basis. I woke up yesterday, knew we was going to Morgantown and started all day. My chest is hurting a little bit, maybe I should go to the doctor. I wonder what the weather's going to do today. I started looking for every excuse and out to get out of that. Then we went. I battle that flesh every day of my life. I'm still learning the love of Christ. I'm still comprehending the love of Christ. But Paul here is talking about the unity of the Spirit 
There's one body, one spirit, called and one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all through all and in you all. Now watch. He wants you to think deeper than this. Because you hear people going around all the time, I'm in the body of Christ, I'm in the body of Christ, I'm in the body of Christ. I'm in the body, I'm in the body. They focus on the corporate identity. But Paul wants you to think different. He wants you to think deeper than this. But unto what? Every one of us. Unto every one of us. Every, this whole body right here is made up of individuals. Man, we'll sit here and draw them out like this. Right? Just thousands and thousands and thousands of believers. And unto every single member of this body is given grace according to what? Isn't that the work of faith we're talking about? You say, what does he mean unto every one of us is given grace? Well, look at Ephesians 3. Teaching like this goes over the heads of, of, a, of modern Christians, man. They've promised, kept, and oath kept, and tithed, and baptized, and dedicated, and Amen. Dedicating babies and then giving them over to a television instead of the Bible. Making foolish oaths before God that they don't keep. They've been, relig they've been performing and performing and doing religion, religion and religion. And the, and the contents of our Bible is a mystery to most people. Look at Ephesians 3. If you want to understand unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Look at Ephesians 3, 7. Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Paul was given a gift of grace according to the effectual working of God's power and that grace given to him made him a minister of the church. But that grace given to you is according to the measure of the gift of Christ. What you have to minister and what you have to do in the body of Christ is according to the measure of the gift of Christ in you. Not according to your ability. Not according to your scholarship. Not according to what degree you get from Dallas or Moody or Wheaton and Fuller. What gives you grace is this measure of the gift of Christ. And that Measure of Christ in you gives you grace in the body of Christ. But it's twofold, guys. We're not just talking about what we do now. Paul says, look at what he says. Wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Not only does this measure of Christ in you give you something to do in the body now, it's going to determine the inheritance in the world to come as well that he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. God has raised us, seated us in the heavenly places, that in the ages to come he might show something. And the measure, the grace that we receive is according to this measure of the gift of Christ. So you know what Christ did? I'm going to be winding down here shortly. Do you know what he did? He gave you something. This is what he did. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. He gave you these things. 
Remember when Paul said, who then is Apollos or Paulos? Who then is Paul or Apollos, but ministers by whom you believe, even as the Lord gave to every man? Who is Paul and Apollos? Ministers. As the Lord had given to every man. God gave these ministers to every man. They're, these ministers, Paul says, we are ministers by whom you believe. But it was God who gave the increase. God is the one doing the work of faith. We're just ministers laboring together with him. You understand in this. God gave you these things right here. Apostles, prophets, evangelists. You say, you say do we have apostles? You've got them right here. The great mystery was not revealed to me. It was revealed to the holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. They ministered it in writing. I have it in writing. It's now my job. The apostles and prophets have fulfilled their office. It's now my job to teach these things. I've got them. He gave these things to us, but why did He do it? Why did He give us these things? For the perfecting of the saints. Why did, why did God give evangelists, pastors, teachers, and all these things? Why did He give these offices? You see these individuals here? They need perfected. How are they going to be perfected? This work of faith. Why is God perfecting them? Why is he perfecting them? For what purpose? For the work of the ministry. The work that God is doing in you is for the work of the ministry. For the edifying of what? Boom. Boom. Every one of these members is being perfected for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. It's the edification of this body. People say, I don't believe in sonship edification, whatever, and all this other stuff. I don't care what you call it. We're not talking about some, I don't care about how another man teaches it. The doctrine is right here. What is the, ed here, what, watch Paul define the edification of the body, the perfecting of the saint, the work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ. Watch how he defines it. Till we all, that's all of us, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of who? I don't believe in it. What is the body of Christ being built up unto? The knowledge of the Son of God. Unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Through Christ in us, every one of these members is being fitly joined together. Me and Eric didn't talk about our messages last night. The whole time he's sitting there teaching, I'm like, go to 2 Corinthians 4. And he's like, I am already am. And that's one mind, one judgment. This is how God wants us all to be. He wants us all to be. Every one of us being fitly joined together by this perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. That's what we're doing. Now, the reality is you and I are his fullness. The body is his fullness. Now, here's what I want you to get. You as the individual only participate and function in this body according to the measure of Christ in you. No participation of the old man. So when you go to the judgment seat of Christ, God burns everything up that ain't Christ, that's the measure you got. We ain't been called to make up His fullness and 
me be a part of that too. It ain't, it ain't Christ and Paul Lucas. It's Christ. What is the old saying says, only one short life will soon be passed and only what's done for Christ will, will last. I don't like that statement. That makes it about what you do. One short life will soon be passed and only Christ will last. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Not you doing a bunch of stuff. Christ in you is the hope of glory. Now let me ask you something. People's like, well, that's a positional passage. Let's see. My little children with whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed where? Well, if Christ in you is the hope of glory and he ain't formed in the Galatians, do you think they got it? Why do you think he tells the Colossians, beware lest any man spoil you. Take heed. Don't let any man beguile you of your reward. What's he talking about? He's talking about men who don't hold the head of this body Amen. by which the whole body receiveth nourishment and increases with the increase of God. They're not increasing with that increase of God. They're not edifying. They're not being perfected and edifying in this perfection that is in Christ and it's going to cost them a reward. It's going to cost them something. Now this measure of Christ in us, I have to... Shut up here. This measure of Christ, I ain't even win an hour yet. What am I talking about? The quit, this measure of faith that we receive of Christ, how does that faith work? Faith which worketh by what? This work that's being done in you becomes operational by love. It only works by love. That's why Paul told the Corinthians, man, yeah, you've received all these things from the Spirit of God. He said, but I show unto you a more excellent way. All those gifts, all those things we receive from God's Spirit are of no value and nothing if they don't operate by love. This is why I love my deacon. I mean it, Gary. I love you, brother. I do. I know that man does that stuff all the time, Bill. Cuts his neighbor's grass and helps his neighbors out. Goes up here and sees homeless men and just stops and gives them money and gospel tracks. When no, listen, listen, Gary. You're doing those things in the sight of God. Man may not see it, but you're doing them in the sight of God. And God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love. Amen. He's not unrighteous to forget it. But a lot of people don't want to do anything until the light's shining on them. Sound the trumpet, I'm about to put some money in the plate. Yep. Sound the alarm, I'm here. Yes, sir. Amen. What a, Christ taught these principles too, man. God that seeth secretly shall reward thee openly. God is going to rip the cloak of all of our religion off one day. And he's going to expose what's inside of you. Amen. God is not unrighteous, man. This faith that we have, it works by love. That's what Paul's going to talk about in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, wives, listen ladies. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as the church is subject to Jesus Christ. Amen. Do you know what that means? Ladies, 
you have the same relationship to your husband that Christ has, that the church has to Jesus Christ. It didn't say, but, but there's no buts or loopholes in there. Now, if you want to be a rebel, you go right ahead and be a rebel. There's plenty of them out there. I've got a head too, and his name is Jesus Christ. But God pity the woman that's constantly got her husband trying to choose between whether he's going to obey her or the Lord. Because I promise you this, man, the Lord's going to win that war. But you know, you listen, you, do you truly know how a husband and a wife become one? Through the love of the husband and the submission of the wife. And I have often found that when a wife is loved, she'll learn to submit and trust her husband. So we're not taking you men. Listen, men, you got a responsibility as well. Don't run around telling your wife to submit to you if you don't love her. But you know how Christ and his church becomes one? Through the operating love of the head of that body working through each one of the members and those members all being submitted to the love of the head of that body. And that head loves that body and nourishes it, cherishes it, edifies it. You can always tell, man, when destruction and contention and division is destroying the work of God. It's carnality. It's a bunch of puffed up people with knowledge. Charity edifies, not destroys. And so wherever you are in Christ, and I see it, man, Yesterday, boys, I'm so proud, man, of my, of my guys. I'm so proud of the work God's doing. Yesterday, we're up there in Morgantown, man, and uh, found out Brother Jason that visited here from Tennessee. He's out on the streets down there in Tennessee preaching. Dr. Dave came out there, man, stood on the street corner and preached with us. Corn out there. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Got up, Paul Kilby, Paul Kilby that visited our church not long ago, man, went back on fire. God is doing things through this church, man. And I know people hear me get worked up. They get me, they hear me yell and scream a little bit. It's like Dr. Ruckman always said, man. The reason, the reason that we are being fruitful is because. You're listening to the tone, guys, but there's nothing but charity and love in my heart. I love every one of you. As my own flesh, I love you all. I have wronged none of you. I will not defraud any of you. I'd rather die than take from you. I care not for my own things, I care for the things that are Christ's. And so these, these Thessalonians now had become men knowing their election and was constantly remembering without ceasing this work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. You see that work of faith right there? That's twofold. Preach the gospel to the lost, get them saved, and then teach them the Bible. It's not hard. People want church to be about everything else other than what it's about. A lot of men sit down there and build these big organizations. You know what our, you know what our job as a church is? Preach the gospel. Evangelize. You say, when are we doing it, preacher? Well, we do it on Saturdays, but you ought to be doing it Monday through Sunday. You ought to be evangelizing your work. You ought to be evangelizing the gas station. You ought to be evangelizing Walmart. You ought to be evangelizing Aldi. You ought to be evangelizing everywhere you go. You ought to have a thing of gospel tracks in your thing, and if you ain't got the guts to talk to somebody, hand them a piece of paper. Amen. 
evangelizing, getting people. How can the body, how can this body increase without any participation of the body of Christ to see people get baptized into it? Yeah. Amen. Yep. There you go. This is, this is where the rubber always meets the road, ain't it? Oh, now we're talking about being responsible. Preach the gospel. It's a shame that we got to go. We got Ben over there, but we're getting ready to take this blessed book back home in April. Guys, I care nothing about seeing England. West Virginia is my home, baby. Country roads, man, almost heaven. I love this dirt. I love this land. I don't care nothing about, I mean, Scotland, that's where my people's from. The Scotch Irish, and I love that land. That's that's the motherland. I'm not going over there for a vacation. I'm not going over there to have a good time. I'm taking the King James Bible home to stand on a street corner and preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ to those people. Amen. Evangelize. Second part of the work of faith is the ministry of the Word of God doing this work here. You get them in, and then you get Christ in them. Yep. Amen. And the last part is this church, once this work of faith is done, that church is to actively labor in the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Yep. That becomes the mercies. You say, what, are the, what is the ministry of mercy? Well, Paul said, blessed be the God of all comfort and the Father of all mercies who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them that are in any trouble. You know what God wants to see from us? He wants, us, he wants to see us increasing and abounding in love one toward another and toward all men. That's what he wants. It's, listen, the job of the church is not a, not a pastor. The job of a church is every member functioning in the love of Christ. You say, what is it? Distributing to the needs of the saints? That's one. Can you cook for somebody that's struggling? Can you come off a dollar or two for some people who need it? If you have this world's good and shut up the bowels of compassion towards somebody in need, how dwelleth the love of God in you? Amen. Amen. It's not just about getting up here and running our trap about the Bible. It's about this body functioning in the love of Christ, in mercy, humbleness of mind, meekness, kindness, gentleness, distributing to the needs of the saints, condescending to men of low, low estate. Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Whatever we do or deed. The job of the church is more than preaching and talking. It's deeds. It's a labor of love. Amen? But it takes many members to do that job. Get people saved. Get them in Christ. Teach them the Bible. Get Christ in them. Edify them together. Perfect them for the work of the ministry. Edify each other into this body so that this body can function in the labor of love. And then wait for the Lord to come. That's the patience of hope. This church will be an example. This church is already becoming an example. Whether you acknowledge, whether you know it or not, man, it's going on. This church is becoming an example to all believers. From this church, the word of the Lord is sounding out. Amen. 
And this church is becoming a church of people who have who have turned from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven. That's what we're doing. We're going to wake up tomorrow. We're going to go serve God. And hopefully it'll be the day Jesus comes. And if it ain't, we'll get up Tuesday and do it again. We're going to keep serving him and waiting for his son to come get us out of here. Amen. Amen. Any questions? Small meeting with the men of the church after church um, just to discuss a few things. Well, I'll just go ahead and say it. I'll just go ahead and say it. That way we don't have to have a meeting. Because we got enough of you men here to, to really talk about this. We need to set up a body of elders here in this church. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, Brother Bill, John Loudon, Gary Sedera, already are patriarchs of this church and nothing's ever going to be done in this church without consulting those men. Gary's been here for close to 50 years. Bill's been here. How long you been here, Brother Bill? 35. Those men will be consulted on everything. Their, their opinion ranks higher than anybody else's. They get a double vote. <laughs> but I, I mean that, that. They're always going to have a high voice. But when it comes to having, I, I need a body of elders to help me when, when times arise that I may need judgment and there needs to be counsel had. If, if something's going on in the church, I've got two or three people to stand there. It's just, in a multitude of counsel, there's safety. Not only that, but Paul talked about the, the presbytery, which is a council of elders, that once Timothy received his gift from this ministry of faith, they laid hands of approval on him. Right? And so we need men right off the bat that can approve offices in this church and approve people for those offices. So you men... Sit and think, and then we'll start talking about deacons. Deacons are directors of ministries. That's what they are. They're ministers. They're the directors of ministry. But we need elders first and foremost, and so you men be thinking about it. And if you want, I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to tell you, you, I want you, I want you, I want you. If you got to desire the office yourself and pray about it, don't beat yourself up and be like, I'm not qualified. The Bible didn't say that he must be sinless. He said he must be blameless. Right? None of us are sinless. But it's got to be a man that's not going out here and defrauding somebody and, you know, just being a nuisance to somebody. He's got to be a man of hospitality, a man of charity and things of that nature. And so you men be thinking about it. Next Sunday, we'll, we'll so Eric won't be here, things of but. We need to get some elders approved or ordained. That was the first thing Paul sent Titus to do, ordain elders in Crete. And so we, we need some elders in this church, and then we'll start, after we get elders appointed, then we'll start, through their, their council, we'll start setting up different offices, teaching ministries for children. I want to see children ministries. I want to see youth ministry here. I want to see all these things. We got the workers to do it. But we need to get some elders approved to set the structure of it up, appoint some things, and then we'll start getting those office filled. So if you want to be an elder here, let me know. Let me know, and we'll, we'll take it from there. Any questions on that? Now, guys, if I, if I, if I, if I come here next week and not a single person says they want to be an elder, I'm just going to lock the door and go home. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all hear that? Don't, don't. Boy, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how, here I am standing up here. I love you, Gary. I sat here and bragged on him all service. He's still, still cut me, Bill. Still cut me. <laughs> they rewarded me evil for good, brother. Hated me without cause. That's what. <laughs> Yeah, well, boy, I must be a big one, because I ran my mouth all morning. If nobody has any questions, uh, Brother Dave, he closes out, brother. I mean, if I
Father, we are so very thankful for the opportunity to gather and to look into your word. We ask you to help us to understand and apply it to our lives. Lord, burden uh, the ones that you would have to be leaders and deacons of this church to step forward. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.